If there's one thing the 7th generation can call its big advancement for the game industry, it's the proliferation of online networks such as Xbox Live and PSN. But the rise of the indie sphere is also enormously influential. In an industry that was leaning into a severe degree of risk aversion, indies became a font of creativity and affordability. Through platforms like Xbox Live Arcade and Steam, they rapidly became a mainstay. The role indies have taken on is that they can be your game of the year that seemingly no one else has played but you. They can be the special personal experience you had one night with evocative artwork and storytelling that makes you feel like the developers are in conversation with you alone. Or they can be a focused mechanical joy that the bloat of so much AAA offerings have long gotten away from. Indies come in all shapes and sizes to the point the definition is rather blurry, which is the case for that game company in their first three releases, Flow, Flower, and Journey all of which were published exclusively on the PS3 via Sony Santa Monica, a subsidiary of PlayStation. Despite those ties, I don't think you could make a sound argument for their artistic vision being compromised. Instead, they came to define the early years of indies with the sort of games a younger me used to amateurishly proselytize the medium as a form of art. Hitting a zenith with their third outing that didn't just dominate discussion amongst the most devoted critical circles, but across all sections of video game fandom. It's been nearly nine years since Journey first released, and you might be wondering whatever became of that game company. That's a question that I've admittedly asked at some point. It's a problematic one though, because they never went away and have since moved on to their biggest hit yet. Trouble is, if you stick to certain more traditional sections of gaming discussion, you could easily have never heard of it, or totally forgotten it's even out. So get comfortable, this is going to be a long one as we go on that game company's journey to Sky Children of the Light. TGC began loosely as a group of students including co-founders Genova Chen and Kelly Santiago at University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts. Cloud in 2005 being the first unofficial game as TGC didn't officially form until 2006. Even the desire to create something more welcoming and distinctly detached from anything aggressive or stressful in the way games often are was clear. We're making entertainment, and entertainment is essentially an emotional supplement for people. That's a quote from Chen himself at one of his many game developer conference panels. TGC's first official release, Flow, took a few extra steps before it became a published Sony product. Initially released as a Flash title in part of Chen and Nicholas Clark's thesis project in 2006, teaming up with fellow USC student Austin Wintory to compose the soundtrack. In 2007, after a successful Flash browser release and the formal founding of TGC in May of 2006, they caught the attention of Sony and signed a three-game contract the first of which would be a remake of Flow in Sony's Fire Engine and was originally intended to be a launch title for the PS3. Unfortunately, overscoping combined with underestimating the time needed to deliver saw a delay from the PS3's November launch to February of the following year. Flow's development was troubled in ways you'd expect from a younger team. From those issues of scoping that led to roughly doubling the estimated time of development to being completely inexperienced with the tech of the PS3. So much so that Sony support was essential to seeing the game finished, as well as outside contractor work from the likes of Jonathan Blow, who worked on the particle effects. In the dev playthrough of the PS3 Collector's Edition, the team discussed a particularly frustrating event where an all-nighter for two members prior to a playtesting session all proved futile as they simply could not get the game to run the following day. Listening to them talk about design philosophy behind Flow is rather telling. Yes, it's relatively relaxing and simple, but first and foremost, it's an experiment. Chen had been recommended Mihail Flow, the psychology of optimal experience. Mihail puts forth the notion that people are happiest while in a state of being absorbed by the task at hand that what lies in front of you becomes all the more fulfilling if distractions are at a minimum. It's the sort of thing that goes into the Tetris state of mind where players become completely zoned into rapidly filling the well. 
which explains why such a rudimentary game has stood the test of time. Flow takes this notion in hand along with adaptive difficulty. Based on the creatures you consume, be they red or blue, you can ascend or dive deeper. It's an in-game, no-menu difficulty slider. They did so with the belief it would be far more welcoming to folks who didn't typically play games. Now, I like to think I'm competent at video games, but I will admit I don't really care about difficulty much. One of the first things I do when I start up a Bethesda title is push that slider all the way to the left. When I play Yakuza, I tend to knock it down one setting below the default. I see challenge to be similar to genres in a lot of ways. I find the hardest settings on things like God of War or Call of Duty to be rather unsatisfying. If a game is meant to be hard, then the developers should lean into that the same way others do for choice-based stories, artistic style, or deep RPG mechanics. I've never cared for the default notion where this medium is something we talk about as an enemy to be conquered. That all games can fit into a design that accommodates for multiple difficulty settings. Because that can be really challenging on the development side to implement properly. So I find Flo's adaptive nature to be an interesting experiment, even if it's not an experience that sticks with me. It's more about recognizing it as an important step in the evolution of a developer. Flo is like a one-sentence story, whereas all their subsequent works are far meatier. According to TGC, Flower is a poem with distinct levels and a progression through them, building towards a poignant reflection on the relationship between the natural world and the urbanization of humans, which is about as explicit the game ever is. Controlling the wind, you blossom flowers in their petals, then form around the gust, giving your avatar a more defined look. While it certainly climbs towards a sort of climax, most levels tap into a calming emotion first and foremost. The vagueness of poetry is quite apt. In a lot of ways, though, it reminds me of Disney's Fantasia. It's an aesthetic experience, one that seeks to meld scenic animation with music composed to elevate those broad concepts. Cues pop when you blossom flowers, which are purposely laid out across the environment in a way that you could sort of understand them like sheet music, or at least a note highway. Vincent DiMartino composed the OST with this in mind. The result being a rhythm game that feels as loose as daydreaming in a grassy field as a cool summer breeze whisks the scent of flowers into the air. The reception of flower and flow is very indicative of the times. TGC was trying to be different, to be directly opposed to the notion of what games were in quite a few ways. Given what games criticism was through the early 2000s, and still struggles with to some degree, this shouldn't be all that surprising. It's amusing and eye-rolling to look back at old coverage of both titles. Reading Chris Roper of IGN's review of Flow, he called it not so much a game as it is an experience. A nearly identical line was used in the game trailer's review when they described Flower as it's less a game and more an experience which was the go-to across a lot of critical spheres for saying, oh, this is an art thing. It's an experience, not a video game, because it doesn't operate under the umbrella of what we see as video games, traditionally speaking. It's telling as to why the world of games was one primed for indie developers to push everyone else to realizing what already should have been obvious, that a rigid definition of video game and whether their art should have long been dead because it wasn't up to the people writing these mediocre reviews or having the conversation ad nauseum around the internet if games needed to be difficult or could be art. They already didn't need a challenge and they already were art. TGC and the wave of indies from that era made it known to a wider audience. Piercing white heat, billions of blistering grains, in the distance hope, or is it a solemn and inevitable fate? Between it and I, a journey. When the developers talk about the early days of Journey's creation, it has an almost kismet quality to it all. Chen telling Wintery of the team's rough ideas and Wintery responding with a single piece, one that helped define the title. Journey is the near perfect confluence of everything TGC had already accomplished and everything they hoped to ever achieve. It is nothing short of a masterpiece. 
I tend to avoid such hyperbole in my writing, but I don't feel the need to qualify my praise in any sort of caveat. With all my other favorite games, I have to do so, whether it's the simple fact that Ocarina of Time is an old game and one of the first to try and tackle 3D and analog controls. How Oblivion is, well, very much a Bethesda product for both good and bad. Journey is just really darn incredible. I don't ever have that moment where I look at something and think, well, I wish they did this a little different, or wow, this part sure doesn't hold up. No moments of my incessant critic brain chiming in. What makes Journey stand out from other visually impressive games is the direction. Plenty have nice graphics or art styles. Not many know how to design the world to be enticing, to have a purposeful camera. Games like Uncharted are known for taking camera control away from the player to force them to look at the visual splendor, which has mixed results. Constantly being told what is worth your investment and what is pretty can prevent us from finding our own appreciation. Journey knows when to both force the camera into a certain perspective and when to smartly let us discover the beauty on our own. It's a true understanding of world composition. The way one sand dune rolls into another, or how a ruin is sandwiched in a valley between them. There's always something to look at, always something just around the corner, and always something in the distance. As you might have noticed, I've been playing a fair bit of Genshin Impact these days. It, like its influences, encourages exploration, but in the opening area, that isn't done by visual design as much as holding 80 carats on a stick mathematically spaced out at just the right distance for proper consumption. The difference between Genshin and Breath of the Wild, as I spoke to in my other video, is the understanding of sightlines. That the best way to make a player want to know what's over the next hill is to entice them with just a little nugget of what they might find. Journey gets this so right, despite being a far more linear experience. In fact, it uses that to its advantage. At any given moment, it's a photographer's dream, stopping you dead in your tracks in order to soak in a majestic beauty. Each locale feels like the setting of a scene in a captivating story. Journey does this in quite a few ways, but the most noticeable is the mountain. Present through much of the game, it's the tallest structure you see in the distance with a beaming split peak the perfect backdrop to elevate any moment to, well, one of a monumental journey. It's so integral to the game's visual splendor that they actually decided to hide it in the main menu the first time through, so that players could have the iconic moment of reaching the crest of this hill. Part of how Journey makes the act of movement beautiful is how it's always giving you feedback. There are constant landmarks and varying types of terrain that you're passing. If there were large swaths of flat land, it would end up feeling like you're not making any progress. But for an area like the massive sand dunes, you can feel progression with each one you go up and down, dotted with little points of interest sporadically. Journey's look from the architecture down to the way the sand glistens is a product of continual refinement, adjusting when technical or creative limitations required and turning that into a well-defined look. One of the most noteworthy instances of this being the arches. Art director Matt Nava originally wanted to have round arches, considering the influence of Islamic culture. However, it was proving difficult to implement, so they opted for the squared, stepped look which is in turn blended into the rest of the artwork, using the new styles to incorporate more influence from indigenous Americans, looking to their usage of loom-crafted rugs and their patterns within. This then melded with much of the cloth creatures and the traveler's design taken from Japanese kites. And of course, that comes full circle back to the Islamic influences upon the many iterations of the player character themselves. If you think Journey's iterative development began in the year following Flower, though, you'd be wrong. At GDC in 2013, Chen mentions that the early days of Journey on a conceptual level date back to the very beginnings of TGC, in part because of his experiences playing World of Warcraft, that the usual interactions with other players, talking strategy, loot, and the unpleasantness that comes with such was tiring. He wanted more types of socializing, more verbs that weren't typical to the genre. Specifically noting the way interactions would take a turn once a player's gender was revealed to be a woman. He wanted to avoid all that. Chen also showed off an old drawing he had done of cloaked figures holding hands and walking through a land populated by giants. The colossal beings kicking up snow and dirt to create a layer of fog cover for the players passing below, but also restricting visibility greatly. 
so much so that you needed to be led by the hand of the player in front of you and do the same for the one behind you. So you can see where these ideas eventually transformed into a game of cooperation. How we ended up with something that sadly hasn't proved to be transformative to the entire medium, but continues to stand as one of the incredibly rare instances where interactions are largely a positive force. Which is interesting and disappointing to think about. What came before Journey and what came after for online experiences doesn't look all that different in terms of how the communities are cultivated to be non-toxic. It's just not a thing that really exists. So returning to Journey for the first time in nearly half a decade was, well, it was incredible. To find that the idealized version I had in my head wasn't a cloud of nostalgia, but a game just as potent in 2020 as it was in 2011. This of course happens through the way multiplayer is implemented. At the foundation you will find limitations. No ID or traditional chat system. The influence you have over other players through your own actions make it nearly impossible to grief. Collision is subtle and in turn provides a charge to mobility, which comes in handy during the later portions where you struggle to traverse a frigid mountain and huddling together is your best means of staying out of the vision of the stone guardians circling above. You can also give each other a boost via the chirp, your only means of verbal communication. Part of the reason for not allowing the players to chat directly via text or voice and not having any parsable in-game language came from Chen's background as a non-native English speaker. He wanted Journey to hit upon the notions of communication through universal emotions, the feelings we have such as sadness, joy, or anger that transcend cultural boundaries. Journey relies on naturalistic matching, meaning there is no lobby or waiting to be paired up with another player. They come and go based on proximity both in-game and in the real world. You're free to leave, you're free to stick close or keep your distance. Though this too is influenced by subtle designs at play. The first area you run into, another player, is a place that is both more open but also somewhat confined. The triangle positioning of the puzzles and the walls on all four sides forces you to retread ground in an area for a few minutes and maybe run into another person. And this is done so because the place afterwards is far more open and easy to lose each other in. Early on it would be understandable to feel that it's lame that someone you got paired up with didn't really stick with you the whole way. But all those different types of interactions and their lengths is the point. That life is filled with relationships of different types and sizes. Sometimes you just pass by one another, and other times you may form a deep connection. TGC did get pushback from Sony on quite a bit of this, with the publisher saying that being able to invite friends is a key tactic in viral marketing. But if you tell players, well, Yes, it's multiplayer, but you can't play with your friends, that sounds so completely foreign. But TGC felt that it went against their low UI presentation. That strangers not being able to talk to each other is less frustrating than inviting a friend and then not being able to converse, which I am in complete agreement with. Strangers are at the heart of any good journey experience. This is because of the reasons I've already hinted at. That we can have that feeling of passing by someone on a hiking trail that producer Robin Heineke spoke to as a key creative influence, or meeting someone we end up sharing a deep bond with, and those bonds can vary. My favorite of all being the result of the lone major change you can obtain in your traveler's design. Through most of your time with Journey, there will only be a few ways to tell travelers apart. They had toyed with the option to alter the color of your robes, but ultimately decided against such. Each player has their own symbol from a preset of a dozen or so. When you chirp, it appears. Next is the length of your scarf, which changes based upon how many of the hidden glowing orbs you found to extend its length and power to keep you gliding, or hits you've taken from the rare enemies that can shred it. More noticeably are the patterns on the cloaks. With each playthrough, you gain another layer of intricate design, becoming a tapestry of your story of sorts. The degree of experience you have. This combined with a long scarf would feel like a situation of haves and have-nots in most other games. Here though, it is strictly a sociological structure that exists purely to designate the village elders of sorts, which through many means, including the plot's vagueness but clear discussion of the past and what knowledge those who lived through it can bestow upon younger generations. And yeah, it's never really a negative. Lastly though is the one instance where, even at a glance from a distance, you can really tell a traveler from the rest. 
that being the White Cloak. White Cloaks are a symbol of those who've seen it all, those that now return to the path to guide the less experienced. It's no mistake they share a color scheme with the Ancient Ones that visit players in their visions between areas. They're meant to be seen in a light of respect and wonderment. This isn't something obtained through the luck of a loot box or a simple grinding. They are travelers who have probably played a half a dozen times at least, and that return, especially all these years later, is a feeling a lot of games have attempted to emulate, but have rarely inspired within me. Having played Journey back on the PS3 several times, all of its secrets are etched within my mind quite clearly still. So it only took me a couple passes to regain my old cloak on PS4. After doing so, I started my travels the same way. But when I came to the broken bridge and saw a red cloak in the distance, it evolved. I approached, and when they noticed, they paused their rambunctious chirping at the cloth creatures. They turned to me, and I gave a small reply, followed by a loud, boisterous one, to really get their attention. I glided over to a hidden orb. They followed. One after another, I guided them around, ensuring they found everything. Clearly, they had not done so in the previous area where they were on their lonesome. As we bounced around, they thanked me with each new discovery. I would pause when they arrived at one of the glyphs to allow them to soak in the history. Eventually, we repaired the bridge and were on our way into the enormous sand dunes. And that's where something really special happened. I wasn't just the veteran player dragging them to all the secrets for the sake of optimal gamer gameplay. At times, I let them take the lead, whether that was from their own initiative or wandering off like a child all the while watching them stumble, boosting them as best I could. A tool when implemented properly, two skilled players can essentially never touch the ground. They weren't skilled though. I'd give them a boost and they didn't quite understand how it was happening or how to reciprocate. But they looked like they were having so much fun. At the first few glyph walls, they'd shout to light up the grave markers around them and reveal the picture. I always casually approached and gently lit them up. Not much time later, they copied my actions. So I stuck with the same red cloak from start to finish. From the innocent moments at the broken bridge and sand dunes, down through the troubling dark of the underground, rising all the way to the heavenly peak of the mountain that has backdropped our travels. I protected them from the malice of the stone guardians, shielded them from the bitter winds, and took the hits when the mistakes were theirs. There was a part in the final ascent where I thought they had fallen behind, I wasn't annoyed or mad, I was patiently waiting as ever, only to find out, no, they had not actually fallen. They were ahead of me, and I felt proud. This journey made me feel more like a parent than so many games wielding far larger budgets, scripts the size of a multi-part novel series that use filmic techniques learned from Oscar-winning movies. So calculated in their intention to elicit a specific feeling, and yet Journey, a game not explicitly about parenthood, made me care more about Hoi565 from South Korea than any of the numerous children in scientifically constructed award bait titles. Journey means a lot to a lot of people. For me, it's something I've gone to at times not to simply take my mind off the worries of life, but to directly confront them to place myself in a sort of meditative state. Whether that be when I feel like the daily stresses have become overwhelming, or through times of grief over the loss of loved ones. TGC rightfully takes pride in fan mail they receive telling them about the extraordinary ways their work has impacted their lives. One in particular always stands out in my mind. One that Chen read on stage at DICE in 2013. In my dad's and in my own experience with Journey, it was about him and his journey to the ultimate end. And I believe we encounter your game at the most perfect time. I want to thank you for the game that changed my life, the game whose beauty brings tears to my eyes. Journey is quite possibly the best game I've ever played. I continue to play it, always re remembering the joy it brought and joy it continued to bring. I'm Sophia, I'm 15, and your game changed my life for the better. And because of this email, I think it's all worth it. Despite Journey's success, clearly it took a toll on the team. Some of its funding came out of their own pockets. Staff had to be temporarily laid off. It was an incredibly challenging development process. While I can't say with certainty this caused the exodus of some key names, it was around this time of Journey and the end of the three-game deal with Sony that the team began to split. 
Co-founder Kelly Santiago began working for Ouya a year later, eventually starting up IndieFund, an organization that helps small teams find funding, and now resides at Google as part of their AR and VR partnership development. Robin Heineke, who had joined TGC as a producer during Journey, left to found Phenomena, which most recently worked on Katamari creator Keita Takahashi's newest game, Wadham. Nicholas Clark, Chris Bell, and others left, while some, like environmental artist Aaron Jesse, did eventually return. One of the biggest departures was Flower and Journey's art director, Matt Nava, who formed a new studio that goes by Giant Squid, which is where we take a slight detour off the TGC highway to a road that has run parallel ever since. Now I admit, like a fair few folks, my impression of Abzu at release was this sure is a lot like Journey. I was higher on it than most, but upon revisiting it, I think the implication that it's just Journey but underwater undersells it. It is without a doubt in conversation with the previous work, but there is far more to it. Firstly, it's not a multiplayer experience. It's solitary, more existential, with a tinge of sci-fi horror and a different sort of environmentalism. Less concerned about the balance of nature and man like Flower, and it's not about pouring through the ruins of a dead society like Journey. The focus is on revitalizing ecosystems, righting the wrongs within them and then meditating within to see not only the beauty of the deep blue sea, but life on a cosmic level. It takes the notion of games anyone can play in an interesting direction. While the hang-up of dual analog controls can be too much for some, and being in the environment you can navigate in a full 360 degree sphere adds layers of complication to that, Obzu takes advantage of one key thing. The ocean and that which lives within is inherently fascinating. Aquariums exist for a reason, and whether you are young or old, they can be a blast. My 5 year old nephew who has mostly stuck to Mario Kart 8 with all the assist on are partnering up with me in Mario Tennis to face off against a pair of AI opponents was utterly fascinated with Abzu one night. Though he struggled with keeping track of where he was in the navigable space, simply swimming around in a somewhat clumsy fashion with tens of thousands of fish was more than enough for him. I helped him along to the first large area where you can see all sorts of creatures from clownfish to barracudas and onto sea turtles and manta rays. By that point he had a loose grasp on the controls and figured out he could hold down R2 to grab hold of a creature and swim alongside them. He did this for a half an hour, just twirling and swirling about on the back of a manta ray. He didn't need challenge or a sense of progression. It was just a safe environment for him, a kid who loves the ocean, to swim around with a bunch of sea creatures. If Abzu is too much like Journey, then the Pathless is a response to such criticism. In many ways, it is far more traditional. In some ways, that seems so antithetical to the core tenets of what TGC and by extension Giant Squid chased after. Firstly, there's combat. You've got a bow, and it's used in very Zelda-like boss fights as well as Zelda-like puzzles. Collectibles are on a larger scale. There's far more UI on the screen, and there's a more explicit story. There's written dialogue, but also voice-acted scenes. In some ways, it's rather reminiscent of the works of Team Eco. In the Pathless, you're a hunter who comes to a vast, imposing land with no human in sight. All that populates it are sparse groupings of fauna and giant beasts you need to face down. This is a game where traversal feels good, as is the case with Journey, but where mastery of Journey's mechanics take a little more effort, the usage of the bow and speed here make even low-level execution incredibly satisfying. I'm also reminded of the Secret Seekers, a group of Shadow of the Colossus players dedicated to finding every last hidden treasure in the PS2 classic. Through all sorts of unlockables, tricks, and glitches, they learn to soar around the land and beyond. Traveling in the Pathless feels like you're getting away with something at times, like you trick the game into giving you powers you shouldn't have. What I find most interesting though is the lack of a fail state. Within the combat, bosses, and some not-so-great stealth sections, there is no game over, no death. The border of the screen closes in, your character stumbles, falls, and gets knocked over, but you never fail. It's all an illusion, and a good one at that. Now follow me here. We're gonna make a comparison that might seem a little odd at first blush, but Asura's Wrath. Yes, that Asura's Wrath. It's a fantastic game, and one that doesn't really present a challenge. There are failure states unlike the Pathless, but more often, what's important is the feeling imbued within the player by the artistic direction and game feel. 
Through superb animation, shot composition, musical scoring, appropriate usage of QTEs, and a direction that ties it all together, Asura's Wrath feels like playing the most over-the-top episode of Dragon Ball Z. The Pathless, while not on a multi-planetary scale, employs the same general concepts. Challenge isn't 100% necessary to make a player feel powerful or afraid. The Pathless has such a strong presentation during its boss fights through some fine camera work, the uses of speed, and truly impressive effects. I mean, look at everything going on with the wind and particles here. I think the biggest divide though between the Pathless, Abzu, Journey, or a Team Eco game is that when it wraps up, I'm not left with much. All of those other titles had me stuck in my seat, contemplating life, or at the very least feeling deeply saddened by what had transpired. The Pathless just ends. There's a message about how in a world filled with chaos that is unfair to its inhabitants, there are those who will try to force their vision of the path forward on others, but that everyone must find their own path in life. And it's not like everything else I mentioned is super complex thematically, but they handle them in far more compelling ways, not just literally stating the moral of the story at the end. I think part of the issue comes as a result of the more explicit nature of storytelling as the dialogue or notes you find around the world are easily the weakest parts. The Pathless doesn't leave you with a swell of emotion like Flower, Journey, Abzu, or Sky, Children of the Light. To rewind the clock now a little bit, in 2011, TGC was an absolute darling in the industry with critical praise and commercial success at their backs, Journey being one of the fastest selling games on the PS3 that year. The big question as time went by was, what's next? The answer didn't come for quite a while. It wasn't until an Apple keynote in September of 2017 that Chen first revealed the then titled Sky on stage. Though folks were able to get a sense for what it was rather soon after with a handful of alphas and betas, something that immediately stood out was the platform. With the Sony deal now over, they were free to go almost anywhere, and that took them to iPhones, with Android tentatively penciled in for a later date. I say this as someone whose background in game discussion comes from more traditional places, the sort of folks who used to delineate between core and casual groups of gamers, which I now cringe at, but mobile games have never really been big in that circle. Of the number of podcasts I've listened to over the years from Giant Bomb, Game Informer, GameSpot, or Waypoint, they don't come up in discussion that much. I mean, even the phrase mobile game has negative connotations with so many. I know I was certainly a little bummed, particularly as an Android user who would have to wait even longer. And so I did, until April 7th of this year when I immediately downloaded Sky, Children of the Light, but I didn't boot it up right away. In fact, I didn't for a long time, until early November to be more precise, which is where we come to the issue I have with mobile. More than the tiny screen, limited control schemes, or tendency to rely on pushy free-to-play mechanics, what bothers me most is my relationship with my phone in general. It's something I'm constantly holding that I always want to put down. It's the thing I stay up for an extra hour with scrolling through the seven layers of hell or catch myself zoning out on while I should be doing something more productive. I don't enjoy it, but am begrudgingly tied to it. Playing something beyond the likes of Fire Emblem Heroes will always feel like watching a bootleg movie. The sort that, yeah, the guy with the handycam really did his best to get the optimal seat in the theater on a slow afternoon, but it's still a handycam so every now and then a corner of the screen slips out of frame, or the guy coughs right into the microphone. For that reason, good mobile games get overlooked, especially by me. Even if I sink my teeth in, there's a better than good chance that the tiniest bit of resistance will cause me to release my bite. Months will go by and I'll see the icon to Sinnoh Alice next to my Twitter app and go, oh, yeah, that's a neat game. But my muscle memory guided tunnel vision fails to notice its icon mere centimeters away from where I click every day. It's frustrating because there are a lot of interesting experiences that I have no good reason for stopping or never even booting up. And also because, well, Sky in a lot of ways is the most fascinating thing TGC has ever made. It's fair that despite Sky being out for two years now, a lot of folks might not know what it is. The short answer is Think Journey, but with a social hub. And I really mean Think Journey. This isn't just another Abzu's Journey but Underwater situation. Both share a nearly identical sense of narrative and progression. For example, let's look at four levels, or areas rather. Two back-to-back -back ones from Journey, and two back-to-back -back ones from Sky. 
about a third of the way into the former, there is an absolutely gorgeous sequence of sliding down a valley at high speeds, where the sand takes on this luminescent tone. It's followed up by descending into a dark underground cavern where serpent-like creatures patrol. If you get caught in their light, you'll be struck and lose some of your mobility. The latter has a sliding section that uses the same side-scrolling shot as the former. Then players go down into the dark depths where, you guessed it, some vaguely serpent-like creatures glide about and drain you of your mobility if you get caught. If TGC were a more traditional AAA studio, I'd probably be talking about Journey 2 and not Sky, and it's beyond the mirroring of level design that is influenced by Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. It's down to the very core. Undoubtedly, the most impressive thing Journey accomplishes is making the notoriously vile space known as online gaming not have an ounce of toxicity. Sky seeks to expand that drastically, where Journey imposes significant limitations, Sky filters them back in and crafts the support around such to encourage kindness. There's an expressive range of emotes, player names appearing on screen, of which there can be several at once. The hub world is very MMO-ish. Most notably though, there's a chat function. Like I know this probably seems really trivial, but think about it. Think about the overwhelming amount of ways exchanging words and chat systems can go wrong. And yet, in all my time with Sky, I've not had one bad experience. In fact, I've had nothing but really positive ones. Even with the semi-awkward situations, it's clear everyone involved is trying to be nice. This is something that TGC put a lot of thought into. Earlier this year, during a remote GDC talk, John Hughes, the feel engineer, spoke to this at length. He stressed not confusing cooperation with social play, that co-op games often make you view the other player as a tool needed to beat the game rather than another human being with their own goals and feelings. That goal-oriented play is the enemy of social play. A lack of direction makes the most interesting thing on screen each other. This becomes clear with just how open much of the game is. Not to say there isn't some linearity, there are start and end points to every area, but getting there doesn't feel like you're being funneled. This along with the side paths and secrets creates downtime to slow the player's pace through these sections, making them more likely to run into each other. Naturally, this is all building towards players wanting to be helpful, especially those who've been around a while. Handholding helps facilitate this while also being really darn adorable. There's a purity to when someone stretches out their hand with the intention of helping. You give control over, and they can guide you around to whatever secrets or interesting locales they desire. Be they a location of a spirit that'll teach you a new emote, or one of the secluded benches that open up interactions. The thought being that this much investment to get to the point where you can chat, then you're less likely to be a jerk. Generally speaking, people who just want to troll are worse will do so as quickly as they can. It's all about instant gratification. But every interaction you make needs to be considered. It's why you can only gift to one friend at a time. As I began my first run through, another player came up to me and held their candle out, indicating they wanted to share their light with mine. This is how they go from silhouettes to personalized models. So we did so, and they guided me to a bench where the chat popped up for the first time. It was certainly odd to see, but they casually said hello, asking if I wanted any help. I said sure, I'm pretty new, not really sure what I'm doing here. To which they replied, eh, it's just kinda a game about chilling with the homies. Then we carried on for 5 minutes, and yeah, you know what? Sky shares a lot with Journey. It has plenty of other tropes from other games too, but ultimately what it does best and what no other game quite has is that feeling of just hanging out. Being the new kid in town, or at a job and you awkwardly fumble around until someone who gets it all a little better than you comes over and says, wanna hang? There's a goal, kind of, there's pseudo skill trees, there are clear mechanics under it all, but only to support this feeling. This is not the emotional experience that Journey is, it's a chill social game. It's the distillation of going to a hub town in an MMORPG and people watching. Maybe chatting with a few strangers who you never see again, or you could become friends. All without that feeling of inevitable toxicity that is so common in online spaces. Everything I've talked about, the good and the bad, is so well highlighted by those closing minutes. It's cosmic. There's a visual splendor happening that just doesn't come from technical prowess, but powerful artistic vision. As you gently glide to the great bright light, it's hard not to see the connections. The connections between you and everyone else who plays Sky, all striving down the same path in their own ways. It's beautiful. But then the tooltips and little UI pop up and it's a real mood killer. 
A realization that for whatever reason the bold confidence that existed within Journey doesn't hear. That maybe they think the player base on mobile needs to be constantly reminded they're playing a game and how to do it. Which is so frustrating because I just want this. I hope when the Switch version drops sometime next year, they have more faith in the players and strip away the pesky UI. I already know by virtue of being on a platform I enjoy with better controls and visuals, I'll likely prefer that version. After all, I will be able to see more of it because my hands won't be covering 30% of the screen. Though there is absolutely something to be said about the reach of phones. No traditional gaming platform even comes close to the install base of iOS and Android. With that comes a lot of folks who may not traditionally pick up many, if any, other games. Especially some artsy indie they'd probably have to pay $20 for on a console. It shows in the number of people I've talked to in Sky that have no idea what Flow, Flower, or Journey are. So I understand why TGC went this route. Simply by virtue of attracting large crowds of people who aren't coming to the game with the developed attitudes, they allowed themselves to steer the conversation in a different direction. Prove that it isn't inherently a toxic environment. And that's incredible. In a year where the overwhelming majority of my socializing has been via Twitter, Discord, YouTube, and video games, I've found communities I've longed for. I haven't really had a place I've stayed for very long since roughly 2013, when I was still active on the Bethesda forums. As that faded with the advent of places like Twitter and Reddit, I wandered around the waste of the internet as a rolling stone of sorts, finding a couple temporary homes here and there, but nothing permanent. I hate Twitter, though it remains a necessary evil. While it can be fun to engage with some folks in my comments, there is a lot that represents nothing but the worst aspects of media discourse online, and it can be just draining. I've not had a place to call home, and that means I've not had a place to talk with people about all the subjects I've wanted to engage with, whether it be video games, anime, politics, or just casually chewing the fat. But as I've spent a lot of time alone at my desk this year, that's changed. I've found places I enjoy, feel welcomed, and have met people I gladly call friends. Almost every Friday night for 4 hours I jump on PUBG and play some of the craziest rounds of an online competitive game I've had in years thanks to a community that has grown around a part time streamer. I've engaged in countless conversations from the serious to the absolutely goofy within a discord that sprung up around a video game podcast where people hang out and watch each other's streams, share their work, vent about life, participate in a monthly anime roulette, and most recently we've started our own Minecraft server. I'm not quite there with Sky, but within the first couple hours and checking out the Discord, it's clear how important that community is to so many. How it's been a lifesaver to some. And that's, well, a shoddy video like mine could never really capture how powerful all that is. Because community is invaluable, especially in times like these. It's December 31st, New Year's Eve, last day of the year, my birthday. If you want to wish me a happy birthday, you can do so over at Words Maybe on Twitter. If you want to give me a gift, you can do so over at Words Maybe on Patreon. I'd greatly appreciate it. I worked very hard on this video and I am now tired and I'm going to go to bed now. See you next year.